Uh, good evening, uh, Council President Dee Medeiros and Council Vice President John Edwards are both absent tonight, so I'll be filling in temporarily. Um, I'll talk about the, uh, what is the date today? 14th. The 14th, the August 14th meeting of the Kiverton Town Council. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Council Perry. Present. Council Shabbat. Present. Council Ryan. Present. Council Hilton. Present. Council LeBeau. Here. Councilor DeMedeiros and Councilor Edwards are absent. Approval of consent agenda. CA1, approval of regular session council minutes July 19, 2018. Approval of regular session council minutes of July 23rd, 2018. Approval of special council meeting minutes July 26, 2018. Number two, receipt of minutes from the following boards and commissions. Charter Review Commission 2, Cemetery Commission, Open Space and Land Preservation Commission, Board of Canvassers 5. CA3, correspondence receive and file, invitation to open house at Amicable Congregational Church on Saturday, September 8th, 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Notice from RIDEM Office of Water Resources regarding maintenance work being done on Nanaquaka Pond Bridge, number 028401. Number four, approval of tax assessor abatements. Number five, approval of petition by National Grid Verizon New England for one new joint poll, P14 on Hayden Avenue, including the response from Richard Rogers, DPW director, and copy of the town stipulations required for approval. Number six, William D. Compton, planning administrative officer report. Number seven, the town administrator, police and fire overtime reports for June. Number eight, Town Administrator July Monthly Department Reports. Would any councilors like to remove anything from the consent agenda? Madam President. <coughs> Madam President. <coughs> uh, number 5A, please. <coughs> and uh, that is the same one I wanted to draw your attention to. That is required for the approval, and it was Mr. Rogers' first day on the job so we had to put it on the agenda but he has some comments to make verbally okay so okay madam president if nobody else is doing if nobody else is pulling anything i have i actually i'd like to uh, take ca6 too see okay i would i was going for that one too <coughs> mr roger Good evening. The whole relocation is shown on the Narragansett Electric Company and Verizon sketch uh, for Harborview Drive. The roadway for Harborview Drive is not laid out yet in the field. However, the whole pole re relocation is shown on the sketch from approximately 20 feet to the west is acceptable on a provision that is located two foot minimum from the existing and new asphalt pavement pavement edge. So I'll ask the town solicitor, since this is under the consent agenda, um, how do we address Mr. Rogers' concern? So I think if you just vote on it as a separate item, now it's been taken off the consent agenda. You could just uh, vote, incorporate his recommendation into your vote as a condition, and just move forward from there. Do I need a motion? I'll make, I'll make that motion to incorporate DPW directors. Uh, Oops. Uh, second, but I do have a question also. Uh, so, do you put this in writing somewhere? Is that is it? We're going to see something in writing afterwards. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll put it right on the approval. Form. Okay. Okay. So I'll get with Richard tomorrow and. Um, okay. No, just uh, just for a record. That's all. Just so that we know yes. that you've got your we've got the notes in there somewhere. Okay. All right. Thank you. A motion and a second. All second. Those, all those in favor? Thank you. Uh, Do you want to approve? 
do this one. And then we'll do the rest of them. Okay. Um, Councilor Ryan, you had CA6. <coughs> yeah, so CA6, I think um, <coughs> on the notes for, I don't know, is Mr. Compton here? So uh, on, uh, on page three, I just had uh, some questions on the miscellaneous for um, the comprehensive plan. Yes, ma'am. So you can sit. <laughs> you can stand if you want, either way. You need a mic. Yeah. Yes. So, okay, so I just found, I realized that the, this is a statewide planning that has come back. And I just wanted to know, um, it's... It, there's not much to it, so I just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about what needs to be done and how, how, what it looked like, and just let us know. Sure. Uh, there were... <coughs> I, I don't have a copy of my report in the letter in front of me, so I'm having to speak extemporaneously. Uh, but there were some minor things that were in the... There were items that were required by statewide planning. Uh, and then there were some other items that were suggested by statewide planning uh, I've spoken with the town administrator and I've also spoken with our consultant uh, and we're in the process of working together to get those addressed uh, these were not items that were unusual type comments to get back from a statewide planning agency okay I guess I'm thinking I'm just I just want to wanted to know what kind of item because there was so much work done on the comp plan for the past couple of years I thought it was right. finally I know that they're not gonna the job is to find things wrong but I wasn't expecting like tons of praise but I just wanted to know it's like is there anything substantive I don't think there's anything substantive uh, one of the items as I recall was mapping recreation areas uh, okay. again I'd be happy to, to research it and respond more intelligently to you uh, sometime tomorrow oh it, it, as long as you respond it's, I mean are, are we going to see it again actually do we have to see it again before it gets so as, as soon as you approve it it's effective as far as uh, state land use yeah I'm, I'm sorry uh, local land use controls yep. um, the approval from the state is just required to make it binding on the state um, depending on what type of changes are being made you, you may need just a perfunctory vote to uh, to ratify the changes from statewide planning into the final document, but that depends on what statewide planning comes back with. And do we need another open meeting for this? Not that open hearing? No, you've already had the public hearing, so that's okay. Part is done. So, so that would suggest that it's not substantive. Is that correct? Uh, I haven't looked at the comments myself, but at least that's what I'm hearing from the uh, administrative officer and the uh, planning consultant. So. I actually, yeah, God, no. I actually, the reason I took this off the consent agenda is that I have a concern about uh, this might be our, it's at least our third, if not our fourth trip to the state. And I realize that Jan was not here when we were developing the comprehensive plan, nor was Mr. Compton. And there is a history behind this in that when we started this, we were given, because the state was in the process of changing their spec for statewide plans we were given a document of interim guidance that this is what we were to do we did that they came back and said we want we want we had a meeting with them and we said wait a second we spent the money we did what you said and they said well okay you know can you change and we did and then we hired a consultant for a third pass at this and i am a little fearful <coughs> that as planners change up there and this document keeps going up there so from my perspective, before we do anything or spend any more money or any more time on this, I think it might be useful for the town administrator and the planner to understand the history of how many times we have met with the state on this. And they've said, if you do just this, that's all we want. This is number four. And it's getting a little worrisome. If I may, um, in my experience, it's not entirely unusual for state statewide planning to do things this way. It's a pretty um, <clears throat> burdensome process, and it drives a lot of people crazy. 
Uh, on the other hand, I took a good look because I had the same concerns. What is this and why do we have to do more? And we better make sure that it is it makes sense. I think the ones that actually were somewhat substantial um, made sense uh, that we were a little light on some of these things. I forget exactly what it was. One was recreation. I think another one may have had to do with housing. And um, I think part of it is in fact, the result of the process taking so long that, you know, three years down the line, there are new circumstances that if we have a chance to put it in, it's actually an hour in the town's interest to update it a little bit. So I, I discussed it with uh, the planner and say, let's do this and I can help with some of the rewrite of some of the issues. Was climate change part of that too? I, it may have been in some of the suggested items. I don't recall yeah, specifically. I, I have a fair amount of background so that I can work with the planner to write the update instead of us having to go to the consultant. The only thing that the consultant may have to do is update uh, one or two of the GIS maps. And again, it actually would be helpful to the town to have the, the update. I think, you know, for me personally, going back and paying the consultant again if we don't have to before this goes forward this is just me I'd actually like to see a list of what exactly the state wants um, because at some point you know we are entitled to draw the line and say this is your fourth pass at it and each time you tell us if we just change this it will be fine so I, well, I'm not comfortable committing more resources to this if maybe it could be on the agenda and the council could see exactly what statewide planning is asking for. What we should do is just send the letter uh, to you so you can review it uh, with a summary of what we think might be the best way to uh, respond to it and then you can take it from, from there. I do think it makes sense for you to see the proposed changes. You will see in the ones that are considered to be not mandatory and sort of for uh, if, you know, whatever readability there are some that, that I kind of go like, this is not worth it in my, to speak frankly. <laughs> um, it's not worth but again, it's sort of par for the course. It, it, the process is known for that, unfortunately. It's, it's not worth what? It's not worth to change or it's not worth to say anything about it? Is, is it I'm not sure if in a public forum I want to go any further than what I just <laughs> said. resources and a lot of planners and sometimes can come up with lots of different things for municipalities to do. Um, okay, so if, are we good on CA6 here? Okay. In that case, if no one else has anything else, um, do I have a motion to approve the rest of the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the rest of the consent agenda. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? All right. <laughs> Next, open public forum announcements, comments, and questions. I only have one. Uh, sustainable Sakonet, William Gerlach, and Shelly Costa in Clean Ocean Access. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the council for uh, uh, having us back here. Just a quick note by way of introduction again. My name is Bill Gerlach. This is Shelly Costa. We co-facilitate the local uh, Tiverton-based environmental uh, advocacy group uh, known as Sustainable Sakonet. Um, Dave McLaughlin, who is here when we were back here in December, uh, who's the executive director from Clean Ocean Access, is unable to join us this evening because he's not feeling well. So um, all of this material was in your um, docket. So this is really just for the folks who are in the, in the room here. So our agenda this evening is quick and to the point. It's a quick refresher on uh, the discussion we had back in December of 17. Uh, Want to take some time to update the council on uh, the policy front. Um, as what's happening both locally, regionally, uh, nationally, and internationally. 
um, talk about the uh, support that we have garnered for um, enacting a ban on single-use uh, plastic carryout bags, um, and then make our request to draft a new ordinance in advance of public hearing and vote. So. Really quickly, uh, just to recap our December 17 uh, discussion here, we introduced this topic and really talked about uh, the single-use plastic carryout bag crisis in terms of the overall plastic pollution crisis that's uh, happening uh, locally, nationally, and frankly, globally, and really its impact on public health uh, as well as the environment. We have included uh, again, some key statistics in the appendix of this uh, presentation. Uh, we highlighted the role that municipalities have played in leading the advance of single-use plastic carryout bag bans. Uh, frankly, this trend uh, continues strongly, and we'll talk about that. Uh, we showcased uh, the list at that point in time of local organization boards and commissions that were supporting our campaign. And again, we've listed that out in the appendix. Uh, we presented draft ordinance language for consideration. And then through our discussion, we took back the request from the council that Sustainable Seconic go out and demonstrate greater public support for uh, a ban on single-use plastic carryout bags, and that is what we intend to demonstrate this evening. So in terms of policy updates, we'll start at the local and regional level. Um, since December of 2017, four additional uh, communities in Rhode Island have enacted bans, those being Portsmouth, Bristol, North Kingstown, and South Kingstown, bringing the total to nine. Uh, so when you add in Barrington, Jamestown, Newport, Middletown, and Block Island, uh, you get nine. We very much would like Tivernon to be the tenth on this list. In Massachusetts, we've seen even greater uh, adoption of bans. Uh, Fourteen additional communities have enacted bans, uh, bringing the total to 81. Um, this again includes Boston. Uh, which is a major retail hub, obviously. Um, regionally, throughout New England, the greater New England area, we see four communities in Connecticut with legislation, 14 communities in Maine, including Freeport, and call out Freeport again because of its uh, retail base, uh, one community in New Hampshire, and 26 communities uh, in New York State. Pulling the lens out a little bit wider, uh, we have California and Hawaii that have entire statewide bans on single-use plastic carry-out bags. So, um, and then globally, um, there continues to be a growing list of countries who are um, taking a leadership position in enacting um, bans on plastic bags or other single-use plastics or have uh, documented their plans to do so. So you can see that list right there, no need to go through that. So just to refresh everyone about uh, what our campaign and what we uh, would like to see uh, a single-use plastic carry-out bag ban ordinance here in Tiverton cover, this is very much in line with what other communities, both in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and across the board, have really taken um, into consideration. So what the ordinance would cover is, again, single-use plastic carry-out bags. To put it another way, these are the bags you get at a point of sale, like at a grocery store or a pharmacy, uh, typical bags that we're all very much uh, used to. Uh, the ordinance uh, would uh, also require businesses uh, to provide for plastic bag recycling if they're not already doing so, um, to make reusable bags available for sale if they're not um, doing it, um, and then penalties for non-compliance. What would be exempt from the proposed ordinance, and this is really important because we field uh, a lot of questions about this, um, it would not cover town trash bags. Uh, we need to be very clear. We've fielded a lot of questions thinking that we're trying to uh, get rid of town trash bags. That is not the case. It would also exempt plastic, what are called barrier bags. So these are typically the bags that you'll get at a grocery store for wrapping your meat or produce, or perhaps what you get your uh, daily newspaper in. 
Uh, double opening bags are the ones that you get at a dry cleaner. Um, also exempt would be bags measuring larger than 28 uh, inches by 36 inches, and that is largely because um, typically reusable bags don't come in that size. And then plastic bags that are greater than four millimeters in thickness would also be exempt because they are considered reusable because of their strength. And again, draw your attention to the draft ordinance language that we have provided um, as part of the docket. So when we were here in December, um, the council asked us to go out and demonstrate uh, public support for this. So Sustainable Sakonic went out and either participated in or hosted a number of events. Uh, since that point in time, uh, whether they be uh, various beach cleanups or participating in other existing um, forums within the town, we were able to collect 216 signatures um, from Tiverton residents who support the passing of a single-use plastic carry-out bag ban ordinance. Um, since that point in time, and we were unable to um, submit it as part of our docket, but I would like to hand it off to the town clerk uh, now, um, is a list of local businesses here in Tiverton who have, uh, who we have talked to and who have express support uh, for a single-use plastic carry-out bag ban. And I'll just give a second for this to make its way around. I think we'll have enough copies here. Do we have enough? I have one more. No, we have enough. So as that makes its way around, so the list so far um, we are talking to more. Um, uh, Coastal Roasters, The Provender, Sakonet Farm, uh, the entire Four Corners Merchants Association, The Meeting House, Tiffany Pay Jewelry, as well as Wilkie Feed have all signed on um, in supporting this bag ban ordinance. Uh, I would call out just Wilkie Feed momentarily here. Um, Mrs. Wilkie is a strong supporter of this, and uh, if you ever talk to her, uh, she'll tell you that she went plastic-free a number of years ago um, and is a staunch advocate for this move. So the request of the council at this point is quite simple. We would ask that the council direct the town solicitor uh, tonight to draft an ordinance um, uh, with a recommended effective date. Again, we have draft language in the uh, packet materials. Then uh, schedule and hold a public hearing to ensure all stakeholders have the opportunity to voice their opinion. And then move to vote and pass an ordinance prior to the November election. Um, and then if the ordinance were to pass, um, uh, we would ask the council to help perform community-wide education and assistance during voluntary compliance period, that being the period between the ordinance passing and prior to the effective date. I will reiterate that as an organization, Sustainable Sakonet uh, remains committed to assisting in that education process, as well as helping to um, collect and distribute reusable bags as necessary. Um, and, uh, you know, potentially, and this is something that we talked to the Four Corners Merchants Association about, and they were very enthusiastic, is using the opportunity to um, uh, do a, or create a local, um, shop local campaign um, and brand reusable bags and try to, you know, drive some additional business here in town. So with that, we'll pause. Um, and see if there are any questions from the council. Anything? Okay. Council, have any questions? I, I have a question. <coughs> Excuse me. I have a question. Um, I was just curious because um, you're just starting this up. So, uh, do the other towns have penalties as well? And because I think you put down in the ordinance you were requesting a penalty. And do the, do the other towns have a penalty? Because I think everybody seems to be in a state of moving this forward, yeah. which I think is good. The only thing that concerned me was the penalty. Yeah, um, I think it, uh, I mean, happy to go out and secure the ordinance language, or perhaps the solicitor could do so as well. I think it's up to the community as to whether or not a penalty 
um, would be set, and if it were set, how much. I think you're seeing communities uh, take um, pretty much a, a central approach with some, you know, slight modifications on whether, um, you know, to charge for certain bags or to, right. you know, not offer plastic bags altogether. But the uh, penalty, I'm not too sure as to the amount uh, okay. that other towns are, are levying. Because I know, um, I, at least it's my understanding, for the state when we're doing recycling and, and we get the towns get money back, Tiverton has gotten money back and it's gotten more money than other towns and that's like a positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was going for, more positive reinforcement, sure. especially at the beginning. And I'm thinking since, uh, which is of these towns that in Newport County, do you know which one started it? Was it Newport? Yes. Yeah, the so oldest? Yeah, so the ones that, and actually, um, not working. Let me just go back up. So, um, so uh, Barrington, Jamestown, Newport, Middletown, uh, Block Island, uh, all in effect right now. Uh, Portsmouth in Bristol, I could double check this. Uh, I believe it's 1119 along with North Kingstown and South Kingstown. Okay. I actually thought Barrington was the first one. Barrington was the first one. Okay. I just Back in, I believe it was 2014. Yeah, that's okay. I was just wondering if they went right from right, right from the get-go to do um, penalties rather than say let's see if we can because everybody in these areas have got beautiful beaches and it's just like that's you know when you see the trash on the on the beaches that's an easy it's an easy way to you know pick up that trash but anyhow that's you know I'm not asking for that information right now um, that okay. that was just I that was, was just trying to look it up and okay it yeah I think that we can we can work on that anyhow I have a comment um, right now in Texas in Laredo, Texas, on this Thursday, uh, the Supreme Court is going to hear this ban bag, uh, ban the single-use bags, and um, they don't know how it's going to go yet. Um, I talked, I called the attorney today to get some information on the lawsuit, and it's going to reverse all the anybody in Texas who had a ban on bags. They're looking to reverse it because it's against the Constitution of the United States to tell somebody what they can use and what they can't. So actually, th that decision did come down. Uh, from the Texas Supreme Court. It wasn't based on the U.S. Constitution, but it was based on a Texas state statute. Uh, it basically said that um, uh, municipal ordinances were preempted by the state statute that said um, uh, Texas municipalities couldn't pass uh, ordinances on that issue. So, And uh, is that the information that I spoke with Tony about today? Is that what you're bringing back to me now? Yep. And so with that note, um, I don't think now is the time for Tiverton to get involved with banning in bags. So um, amongst a bunch of other reasons that I have personally, but to protect the town and any lawsuits coming in the future, I don't agree with uh, banning the bag. Everything, everything that goes in them bags is plastic. Your cupcakes, your ring things, your Twinkies, everything in there is wrapped in plastic. And we're putting them in the plastic bag, so you're, you're taking... You know, it just seems like, like I spoke to. You did speak to me, and, I, and I'm, the point that I bring up is just because. Um, I forgot your name. I'm sorry. My name's Shelly. Shelly. Right. Just because there's more plastic problems that we don't have the solutions for right now doesn't mean that we just don't come up with solutions. I mean, we have to start where we can, and then build off of of all those spots and keep improving and doing the best that we can. Um, and as far as a, a law in Texas, I mean. It's a different state. They've got different um, state laws, and Rhode Island doesn't have those state laws. So I don't think that that would cause problems for the bands here. We don't know that yet. Nobody's challenged well, that yet. So. To, with all due respect, Councillor Lebeau, um, a couple things to respond. Uh, I concur with with Shelley here on the fact that just because you know we we shouldn't not do anything, there's a viable alternative in the form of reusable bags or paper bags to tackle this problem. We have to start somewhere. The other point is that there's a clear trend throughout the country that municipalities are leading the way. Third is that the state has in, 
uh, introduced legislation in both the House and the Senate to review a statewide ban. That hasn't progressed yet, but I would imagine that if something were to go against state law uh, or state statute, that those bills wouldn't have even been introduced. So I think the risk of a lawsuit coming down in the state of Rhode Island um, or in Tiverton over a plastic bag ban, um, I just, I think that risk is low. Well, maybe so, but you, know, you guys know where I stand on it. And, and I do think that we're seeing a growing list of businesses in town who are showing support and recognize the, you know, this isn't just a feel-good sort of option. There's clear scientific data and evidence that the introduction of plastics, especially microplastics, into the food chain can cause harm in terms of public health. This is part of the problem. This is not a silver bullet. I'm not going to, you know, try to blow that smoke. Nope. But uh, if we, you know, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, and, and we agree. think that this is a really solid s single step, and frankly, an opportunity for the town of Tiverman to take a leadership role in the state and the region uh, to demonstrate support for improving public health and countering uh, what is really a global plastic pollution issue. Uh, I understand all that. So today, well, I was on a little downtime. I did some more research. Back in the 60s when all this started, the big ban was on paper that saved the trees. And that's how plastic bags came about. So now we're back on the other side of the fence. Now they, everybody switched over to plastic. In 1985, 80% of the country went to plastic because they were saving the trees. Now we're going to go back. Well, yeah, so, so let's use. Yeah, so first of all, trees are a renewable resource. Um, well, second, well, I do imagine that the plastic lobby been, had a fair amount to do with that. Let's we could debate trees. that. Right. So, well, no matter what, let's not go any further because my, you know, you sure. guys know where I am. And so, that's. But I do commend fair. you for <coughs> doing your part. Uh, Madam President, just a couple of questions. Um, I see the list of businesses that you visited uh, to get their feedback. Did you go to the, like the major uh, businesses in town, like CBS, the national, Rite Aid, yeah. you know, so, uh, um, Tom's Market, Dollar General? Yeah, you know, they have a, they, their usage is pretty high. Yeah. So, um, Councillor Shabbat, we have not. However, I would um, point to the fact that national chains or even regional chains, such as Rite Aid, CVS. Um, Dunkin Donuts those sort of things have footprints in other communities both in Rhode Island and especially Massachusetts I've done the analysis uh, where bag bans have been put in place so from an infrastructure perspective from a corporate supply chain perspective it would be anticipated that um, you know such a ban would not necessarily um, uh, negatively impact a national chain um, to the degree that you know we think it might and Tom's market they're a local so I did talk to Tom's market actually and I you know a lot of businesses shared some concerns and I don't want to um, identify which mark which place shared which concern because that wasn't something that I had asked them that I could share with other people but I could share some of the concerns with you without identifying which places they were but I can let you know that I did talk to people at Tom's Market I mean I talked to Sakonet Outfitters I talked to um, a lot of places some of the things they said um, some of the bigger places said that they knew it was coming and that they'd adjust when it happened um, somebody suggested trying compostable bags and seeing if that would work for their business um, you know they were wondering if other things were coming down the line as far as other plastics and I mean these are uh, great conversation starters um, I don't you're not going to go through bans for every single thing but maybe even just starting the conversation gets businesses thinking about different ways that they can do things and trying out new things just by kind of bringing up the conversation which I think was great and I got some great feedback um, no one was, you know, really harsh. It was great conversations to have. They were all very nice, um, and some wanted to know more. And a, a lot of, unfortunately, it's a busy season right now, and a lot of the businesses, it's been very hard. I'll leave messages and call two or three times, and I haven't really connected with them all yet. 
Um, so it's something we can continue to do in the future. And, and just one other note, uh, Warren is in the same place that Tiverton's at. Um, in terms of entertaining a possible ban. So knowing that Tom's, um, you know, has their shop back in Warren, I'm sure it's on their radar as well. And the only, my last point on that would be, you know, we would welcome the opportunity during a public hearing for, you know, all key stakeholders to have a voice at the table to um, share their concerns or their support. So let me just continue on here. Um, the next um, thing I'd like to ask is, what is the cost differential between a single-use bag and one of the ones that are allowable, the sustainable bag or reusable bag? Um, I just bought, uh, so if you go to Clements or Lee's, uh, I just bought a couple of bags. I think they were, you know, 99 cents each. Uh, no, I mean the, the actual, you said the heavier mill bag. Oh, the four millimeter the plastic bag? Correct. I, I don't know, Consular to look about, you actually used those, I right? I did. It's uh, $6 per thousand. It's $24 per thousand for the, for, well, it's actually for the paper. From, from single use to paper, is $6 per thousand. Difference. The difference. The difference. The difference. That's, that's per one thousand bucks. Right. That was okay. today's research online today to buy them online as at a retail. Retail, retail not wholesale. wholesale. I mean wholesale. Okay. As a wholesaler, that's what it would cost me six bucks more. Six. But again, like you said, I use the heavier bag most of the time when I can get yeah. them because we don't sell light stuff and very few. Again, we don't use very many. Just, so so is that, that going from the yeah. light lighter bag to the heavier bag? A lighter bag the, from. The single use to paper is six dollars per thousand. Yeah, but per what one thousand. Per one thousand bags. So about twenty percent. That's going to paper. It's going to a, pa a bag that's going to biodegradable paper bag, mm -hmm. right? I don't know about going to the heavier plastic ones. It's roughly the same. Okay, so there is a twenty percent increase cost. in the cost. In the cost. Of um, my only concern is um, this ban is basically on our businesses in town. And we've already gone through an ordinance and it's, we have a, actually haven't passed it, but on outdoor seating where we're trying to streamline that process and um, didn't get the businesses involved up front. So, I hate to be embarrassed again to have a public meeting and then have businesses come in and um, voice their opposition to this. Um, certainly, uh, um, you're making we're making assumptions because this is also um, our food services uh, where they um, for takeout uh, they have uh, bags as well. So it it hits a large. Um, it hits, hits all of our businesses in town, basically. Um, so I'm a little leery of hitting them uh, without their feedback. Um. So I think that's fair. Um, my, my question would be, I mean, we as a volunteer organization can attempt to try and solicit input and feedback, or we could draft an ordinance and hold formal public hearing, which will get the same sort of results, whether it's us. Frankly, I think you get a better turnout and a better response with a formal public hearing sponsored by the town than a bunch of volunteers trying to track these guys down. That's my opinion. Um, in any case, I do, the only other thing, I, I think we're not, we're very sensitive to that. I grew up working in my father's restaurant business. I'm very sensitive to a small business uh, type of culture. The precedent is being set, though. And, uh, you know, there are far more, I would say, retail um, outfits in other communities um, that have enacted the ban. Um, I think there's a precedent being set. Um, and I think it's one where um, the, the alternative is not necessarily the end of the world. 
I mean, $6 on a thousand bags is just over three cents a bag. Um, but I think consumers, and clearly demonstrated by the 216 citizen signatures that we got, which for the time being is four times the amount of signatures required to put an alternative budget on the docket, um, you know, uh, I think cons I don't want to lose sight of the consumer and the citizen input here um, amidst all of the discussion about the businesses. So, and to respond to that, 216 signatures mean 216 people can act right now and not get when they go into a business. They can refuse to take a plastic bag, mm -hmm. and that's a direct impact. So they can do that now. They don't need an ordinance to do that. They can do that today. But what you're saying is you're putting a restriction on the market. So you're putting a restriction on businesses. And they didn't have a say. And at this point, they, you get enough people to say, oh, I don't want you to do that. Um, it impacts the business. So they're going to have a 20% increase in costs for their bags. That is going to be translated into dollars back to the consumer, whereas the consumer goes in. And I've had people come to me and say, don't get rid of the sing single-use bags. I use them. I need them. So I have the flip side. There are some people who want them still uh, and use them. So I've, I've heard both stories, and I've heard uh, businesses' re response to this. And so I'm just concerned that we're, again, implementing a basically another impact on our business that will cost them money, and then in turn, it will cost the consumer money as well. Whereas if you don't want to participate in it, those 216 people can go in and bring in their reusable bags and use them every time they go into the store and have an impact. That's, that's all I'm saying. So, uh, Bill, I have to say that um, as, you know, someone who comes from the Conservation Commission, um, I wouldn't mind seeing all these plastic bags go away because it's, if you clean up the beaches around here, it's just an absolute mess. But of um, the list that you've given us here of the organizational support, I noticed that there are two Tiverton organizations, the Open Space Commission and the Harbor Commission, which I think is great. There's one more organization that I would really like to see on that list, and that is the Economic Development Commission. That's a um, you know, generally, I think that of the carrot and four stick approach, that I always like the carrot approach better. Um, and, you know, sort of just passing an ordinance is a bit of the stick approach. But I think that if we or if you were to work with the Economic Development Commission and get the businesses in, and potentially there are things that we could do, you know, that wouldn't cost a lot to incent the businesses, whether that's recognizing businesses that want to participate in this, some sort of shop local, shop sustainable campaign, something on the Facebook, maybe we can find some grant money or we could find some funds to actually buy some number of the, um, you know, the recyclable bags um, and put, you know, the businesses' names on them so that they get some advertising. I mean, I think that there's a, an in-between way here to give the businesses the opportunity to participate. And frankly, I think a lot of the local small businesses, many of them are owned by Tiverton residents. They don't like the, you know, they don't like the garbage bags everywhere either. So, you know, my suggestion would be for, for your next step would be to go work with the Economic Development Commission and see if together you can't come up with an outreach program or some ideas as to, you know, bring the businesses in through the Economic Development Corporation and Commission here, which has the, you know, that's part of their charter. Um, see if you can come up with some plans. 
see if we can help find some funding, whether it's grant money or something we have here, or maybe we even have something in our recycling account that we could actually use um, to help, you know, lessen the burden on businesses and and offer the businesses some kind of incentive to join in on this. That would be my suggested next step of, of where to go with this. And I think EDC would probably, you know, receive you well. So, okay, one more minute. Um, what I would do, um, like I said, I commend you guys. I'm trying to say, I'm trying to do this. I would put a recycle bin at my shop for all plastic. They can come in, recycle the plastic, one, give them a ticket. Once a month, I'll do a drawer and you give somebody a one hour gun training seminar. They bring their, they bring their plastic bags to me. Everybody gets a ticket. It's going to cost me more money than it, than it is to get rid of these bags, but it helps the environment at the same time, helps the businesses, and somebody can get a, something once a month for a, <clears throat> gives them a, some kind of incentive to bring their recyclable bags to the shop, throw them in, helps the businesses, and uh, something like that. Just, <coughs> just, I just don't, I'm not an ordinance being type of guy, but I would do my part in doing that, putting a recycle bin at my shop inside and we're open all the time and again give something once a month i'll give them a lot a ticket we'll draw once a month and somebody can come in and have a you know that'll keep them off the beaches and they'll get some experience in a gun range if that's what they like <coughs> so i think there were a lot of good comments I, I think you're going in the right direction i think i think you just got to keep the momentum going i do use I do use paper bags to recycle, but I also bring my bags to the store, and I've seen a lot of people doing that. And I also say I don't need a bag, so people are people are aware. But I think I would uh, I wouldn't do the ordinance make a motion tonight just because I think it's more important that all of us are here to to discuss it because we're missing two people on the council. So I, you know for that reason, but I think for other reasons too. There's different suggestions that people have made other businesses might want to also have a you know I'll put a plastic bag in there and I'll tell you if you start publicizing that this 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 and this organization or shop is putting in plastic bags or they'll retake your you know that's positive for them as well but I also would just suggest also uh, back up what Joan said about um, uh, the businesses to really get the not that the businesses are more equal than other people but it is true that you know they they really need to get be on board and you certainly have got some of them going but you've also got one down at the end of this table who's also said he's interested even though he might not agree on the ban he's interested in helping out with the clean so i i would think if you could do that and uh, i would go in an incentives and at some point and at some point if, if it starts with an incentivized program, at some point then it might not be a big deal to have it be an ordinance because at that point people say, you know what, this works, the town's cleaner, there's less plastic bags, and, and you know, the business community embraces it. So I, I'm not, in my opinion, it doesn't mean you'd never get, we'd never get to the point where we could say that's it, no more plastic bags everywhere. But, um, and, and I'm, you know, if you haven't met with the chair of the EDC, and I know there is a member right Actually, here. Actually, I, I have, so. Okay. And we're planning on going to them, so. I think that, that that's an excellent place to start, and possibly the town administrator may have some ideas as to whether or not um, we have any, re you know, recycling money or opportunity. It's too bad we're not about a month earlier, because they think Rhode Island Resource Recovery just closed their grant period mm. for stuff like this. But there's always next year. Sure. Um, I know that Barbara wanted to say something. Uh, Barbara Pelletier, at Bonnie Field Drive. You have some great ideas about the bags and the printed advertising and that, uh, Councillor Hilton. I was just wondering, do you have any ideas how many bags actually are given out by the major stores, I know you have the Tivot and Four Corners, you uh, did some surveys, but I just wondered how many bags are actually, you know, fairly... Um, yeah, un un we don't have that data. I mean, yeah. we haven't requested that data. Right, because I'm just wondering, um, uh, volume-wise, cubic feet-wise, how much plastic is that? Is it? enough boxes to be the size of that table? Is it enough <coughs> boxes of plastic bags? I'm, I'm just wondering about the volume of bags that are given out and 
and we don't get excited about other plastics in a sense and maybe we should get excited about the food wrapped in plastic which we know is not good even I put my stuff in glass containers in the fridge so uh, I, I just wondered if we can't really solve the problem without uh, passing another law uh, but I do I, I'm really curious how many thousands of plastic bags get dispensed in Tilton per year that 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 might be an interesting find out you, you know the the stores know how many they order sure. so just curious okay yeah. thank you well, if it's okay with you I would suggest you would meet with them and then at some point come back with the EDC and we'll see where we are thank you, thank you very you. much Moving on, public hearings, advertised public hearings, we have none. Uh, town Council sitting as a Board of Licensing, advertised. Uh, Matthew Foster, DBA, Innovative Pools and Spas, Inc., 295 Main Road, Tiverton, request holiday license renewal. Is Mr. Foster here? It's just a Okay. In that case. Madam Acting President. I will make a motion to approve his holiday license. I have a motion and a second. Second. Discussion. Um, Madam Clerk, is everything in order on this? It's just this one sheet. In that case, any discussion? I have a motion and a second. All in favor? No appointments or resignations, unfinished business or financial business. New business, Linda Larson, Tiverton Days. A post report on Tiverton Days and a request approval for town sponsored family movie night and pumpkin showcase. So back in front of you again uh, to report out like we did last year on the 28 day, 2018 Tiverton Days event. Um, all events were well attended. Um, they were all uh, incident free, thanks to, uh, to our great townspeople and our, our police and fire departments and, and those that are here. Um, we just, uh, you know, want to thank our planning committee, um, which two members are here, Barbara Pelletier and Kelly Levesque, and, and the others are, are watching from home. Um, without them, it wouldn't be possible, as well as our sponsors and, the, and those who have donated. Um, and because of their generosity, we've been able to cover the costs of, of all, um, everything, all the costs of, of the uh, three-day event. We received some great um, press coverage from uh, Joe Good over at the Fall River Herald News and Julie Furtado over at Sakon at Times. So if you uh, were, had a chance to, to pick up the newspapers, we had some, some great photos in there. Um, I did put a report together like I did last year, which I will give to the town clerk for your review. Unfortunately, I didn't get it into your packets in time, so I know I can't distribute it here. Um, if you have any questions or would like to go through anything, we are, uh, I'd be more than happy to answer anything um, that, that you may have. We will be sending out thank yous to, to everyone. We had some cards put together with a save to date. So next year's event is July 26th through the 28th. And we certainly thank the town council for their support and, uh, and allowing us this, this to be a uh, town sponsored event um, for our community. What did you say, July 26th next year? July 26th through the 28th of 2019. Can we um, try to get the high school next year to stop the little problem that we had at a restaurant, the parking? Um, we will certainly do our best. And for the movie thing that you're doing now, let's try to get the high school plenty of parking over there. So um, we have, we will talk about the movie next, but for this event as well as prior years, we have submitted all of our paperwork um, to the school department for superintendent approval. Um, we've had... Um, support from the town council, the fire department, the police department, so forth and so on, the athletic director as well as the high school principal. Um, it's been the superintendent's decision. He's going. Um, so we will try We will try again. So uh, um, we will continue. It is, uh, the high school is a great location. Parking is there. Ranger School is there. It's a neighborhood that's used to uh, a little bit of activity um, with, with the high school festivities. So, so we, will, uh, we will continue to go back um, to, to the school. Mm -hmm. You plan on doing the bonfire next year? So um, everyone was in love with the fire pits, including um, Chief Lloyd. 
um, the fire pits were bought and donated to the town. The town does owe them now, own them now for, for future events. Um, everyone loves a bonfire though, so we will certainly come back and, and discuss that as a future time. Um, but the fire pits were a great hit as well. Who got them fire pits going, just for the record? Um, the fire pits, um, there was 13. No, not donated. Who got them burning? Oh, who got them burning? Yeah. You know, the Tiverton Fire Department, we really have to uh, <laughs> give kudos to <laughs> Chief Lloyd and uh, and his team, um, but they did have a, a helper in Council of LeBeau. No, um, it's because he had, used to do it when he was a kid. Yeah, that's why. We had some green wood, and, uh, but the uh, our, our fire department uh, certainly took charge pretty quickly and, and was able to man those I'll never those make pits. it as an arson. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to know how. How you got them started? I didn't. I no, didn't. no, it was, uh, there was a quick transition. Um, TFD was certainly uh, was on the, on the call there. Yeah. Linda, now you have a request for a town-sponsored movie night and pumpkin showcase on Sunday, October 7th from 6 to 10 p.m. We do. We're coming back for, for town approval again like we did last year. Um, however, you know, Grinnell's Beach is still under construction, so we'd like to move that. We did not have a movie night this year with Tiverton Days. Um, it was a lot jam-packed into, into a three-day, uh, too many events in, in a way. So we wanted to take the movie night in combination with the Pumpkin Fest um, and put it up um, either at Picasset Fields or we will go back to uh, the Tiverton School Department for request of the use of the high school. Um, so it's the exact same events just just combined. I, I have it as a request subject to it's my understanding I believe the Rec Commission Committee is meeting tonight so we do have to go before them for approval of Picasset Fields. I do have all the paperwork filled out for the school department as well for submission um, but I wanted to come before you first to, uh, to for approval. And can you just clarify um, for in terms of town sponsorship exactly what we did last October that it would be a town sponsored event the, it would meet all the criteria um, as set forth by by the solicitor it's free it's access to all we don't make any money um, it's a blow-up movie um, screen like we had last year on Picasset Field showing a family um, fo uh, film um, we let the community decide it might be something Transylvania like because it is October um, we don't use any candles in the pumpkins we use the glow sticks so forth and so on. So it's the it's the town sponsorship would being it's a town sponsored event. It's under the town insurance, um, the trust with the tulip program, um, like we did last year. Mm -hmm. That's great. Did, Linda, do you have a rain date in case? So the rain date is built into the contract. So I don't have a contract signed okay. with an outdoor. There's a couple of different outdoor movie companies that have blow up screens. So you can coordinate that. Um, we don't want to go too far into the very chilly you know, time right. of year. Right. Um, but the rain date we would and then come back for approval or amendment to whatever that date may be. All right. If there aren't any other questions, do I have a motion? Sure do. I'll make a motion we grant. Tiverton Day's permission to hold the family night on Sunday, October 7th from 6 to 10. Uh, location to be determined at a later date, either the high school or the Picasso Recreation Field. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Thank, thank you. you very much. And just on behalf of everybody, I'm sure, thank you very Great. much for your, your you. entire committee's hard work on Great different job. days. Thank nice you. job. Thank you very much. And, and Linda, there's no meeting for the rec committee tonight. They didn't have a quorum. Oh, okay. So we'll be able to get it in yep. pretty quick. Thank you. Uh, next, the Open Space Commission requests to advertise for public hearing on proposed revision to Town Code Chapter 54, Sections 54 through 26. And 54 through 35, recreation, <coughs> open space, and other town areas and buildings open to the public. Good evening, Mr. Plunkett. Good evening, members of the council. Uh, this has been in progress for a long time. I'm glad to see that it's finally come to be reviewed and uh, possibly uh, taken care of. The, the memo that I wrote. Uh, for this item is pretty well summarizes all the changes that would be in the ordinance. Uh, we could go over those briefly, but uh, basically it, it includes 
the new ordinance will include open space properties that weren't in the old ordinance, so that needs to be updated. It changes the management responsibility for the Falkland Beach Conservation Area from the Conservation Commission to the Open Space Commission. Uh, the Open Space Commission, that's their primary role, uh, managing uh, public preserved areas. And so it's kind of a natural shift. There was a, there was a committee formed many, many years ago uh, between the Recreation Commission the Conservation Commission and the Open Space Commission to manage that area down there. Uh, it's become difficult to get together, uh, you know, one more committee and one more meeting and so on. So they requested this, that the Open Space Commission assume that and the, the, the Open Space Commission voted that we would be willing to do that. Um, third item is to delete a provision giving Recreation Commission authority over coastal rights of way, which is not legal because that belongs to the Harbor Commission. So that's basically just a correction. Um, reflect recent changes in the town regulations regarding dogs in public areas. As you recall, we passed a big ordinance on that, uh, which was different than what we had in our ordinance so that it makes that consistent with the town ordinance. Uh, revise the process for request requests for special use of public areas. The old uh, process was kind of clumsy and unclear, so that was just clarified and uh, uh, I think improved. Um, and since there was some overlapping coverage between this ordinance, which has, has existed for years, in an old section of the town code 50-1, uh, we recommend deleting that town code part because uh, part of it is out of date and the, the part that's not out of date we've included it in, the, in this ordinance uh, version. So I know it's a long list but it's really pretty much administrative, uh, an administrative update and it needs to be done. Uh, we have new properties that uh, we need to officially be given authority to manage. <laughs> so I'd be happy to respond to any questions. Um, I question for you on uh, number six you have no firearms um, metal detectors I can see paintball guns stuff like that but the firearms meaning hunting like for guys walking around in there with hunting rifles and stuff because people who a lot of people in town have permits to carry for self-defense or defense purposes coyote stuff like that anytime I go in there personally I have my firearm with me um, and it's not legal to lock it in the car so I'd like to see no f I permitted people with permits to have their firearm on their person. Because no firearms is a broad, I'd like to see like permit. Like I have a permit to carry, anybody who has a permit to carry can have their firearm on them when they're in these areas. Because no firearms is kind of, uh, I can see open open shot, somebody walking around with a shotgun or a muzzle loaded gun or something like that. Right. Absolutely. But, it was just put in there because of the fact that there's no hunting allowed. Or no uh, hunting or right. in those areas where there's no hunting, I can see. But to, just to say a broad statement with no firearm would make me illegal to walk somewhere because, or not just me, anybody who has a permit to carry. So is, can we change that? Yeah. This is an open space area. All areas. Right, but it's open space. I mean, what do you do well, for a person that carries a firearm everywhere they go? They can't leave it in their car. It's illegal has to be on your person. So if you're going somewhere, you're going to go to an open space um, and with a permit to carry. I'm saying with a, with a state or town permit to carry, I can have your firearm on you. If, not for hunting purposes or anything like that. Just yeah, like, no, I understand what you're you know, saying. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, to leave it in the car. I, uh, I have no comment on that yeah. for or against. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to change that if, I mean, if it's all right, could I ask the chief of Peter. police? Yeah, what the deal is with it, chief? Peter, do you have any idea? That, that's that's really just a policy consideration. Uh, you could just strike out the word firearms from that sentence. Uh, you could strike the sentence in uh, section fifty four thirty one subsection six. Uh, you could add in a clause that say no firearms, excepting uh, for people for, with a concealed with carry permit. Right. Uh, so there's, there's certain ways you can deal with that. The other stuff is okay. Not you don't want nobody metal detecting over graves and paintball shooting up trees and all that, but for a person just to have their, their off-duty weapon on them. Yep. 
I don't know what, how to go forward from this second on what's being said now, but. I mean, I think it can be noted. I mean, ultimately, this is a request for a public hearing. So, um, you know, other people may have comments or thoughts about it, too. And at the end of whatever comes out of the public hearing, then some of this language may or may not be adjusted. Right. This is not an opinion of the ordinance. It's just right. asking to hey, hold on. State, state law may allow the person to carry the gun there. The chief will know that. Chief, could you, could you answer that for me? So, property. if it's on town property, if, if somebody has a permit to carry and they're on this concealed, not out in front, so would, would, would this make it a no? If it was not necessarily, if they're permitted by the state and local police department, they'd be authorized to carry. Okay. As long as they're meeting all legal requirements, unless there's yeah. a policy that's that other council or an, another law that would preclude that. From okay. Yeah. So, probably we'll, we'll discuss it more yeah. at the public hearing. The only anybody else actually John? well um, what I find difficult is I, I've been going back and forth from the ordinance to this to try and identify what's different and so I I really prefer like a uh, mock-up copy. Uh, mock copy rather than this because um, in the original it said something about a Sanford parcel yet unnamed open space yeah, that that is now in Casa Ridge. Okay. That was that was the only property we had at that time, uh, that and, and it wasn't even open yet. So now we have the Casa Ridge. So that's included in there. And and not being familiar familiar with um, so much with Fogland Beach, I know like on one side uh, is is the beach, but on the other side you have the wind surfers. Um, is is that the side that would be non recreational okay. now? The original, the original plan was to conserve the salt marsh area and the the vegetated dune area, yep. uh, and that's uh, that actually was surveyed, and the survey is uh, recorded and it's referenced in uh, the plan. Uh, it's really, uh, it's really pretty simple. It's the salt marsh area that's that's in the the armpit of the arm going out uh, <laughs> on the on the north side. And it's it's uh, uh, salt marsh grasses and so on and, so, and vegetation. There's really not that much to do back there because it's wet. It's a wetland. Yeah. But uh, it could be damaged if people started to creep in back there and 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 tear things up. There used to be a problem with dune buggies going down there and yeah. running yeah. through it. Yeah. And then the uh, the sand dunes those need to be preserved and vegetated just just for uh, uh, storm. Uh, surge problems when uh, there's high winds and hurricanes and so on. So uh, basically, they can do everything on the north side down on the beach that they can do on the on the south side. That's what we tried to say in the ordinance. All right. Um, so, so just so as you mentioned, it there's um, a survey plan um, that is is that this or is this something else? No, that. No, that, that's that's a, a survey plan of just Falcon Beach. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, taking out the Conservation Commission, were the Conservation Commission responsible for the vegetative areas and dunes? Well, they were originally on the uh, that three-part committee, uh, and yes. they sort of led that that group. That was their only responsibility in this ordinance. So since if this ordinance is passed, that the Open Space Commission will assume management responsibility for that area, then they have no other reason to be included in the ordinance. So that's the only reason why they were So those, those responsibilities go over to Open Space? Exactly. I mean, it, it makes sense, because that's what Open Space does. Um, and then you have... Um, uh, 54-31, no person is permitted in areas when closed except by special permit. So you, you took out the special permit? Well, uh, it, the rule is that if it's closed, there's no reason to be in there, yeah. And so, I mean, if someone came to the council and got a special permit, I mean, it seemed to be obvious, so it just didn't seem to be 
it didn't seem to be necessary to say that. I mean, it suggests that there's some special permit process, and there's not any special permit process. So I, I just didn't think it was worth putting in there. Well, really, the idea is that it should be closed <laughs> at night. Okay, but in, in this is under, it applies to also town recreation. And right. we basically do have, uh, if there are activities during a time where the recreation area is closed, then they have to go to the, con the recreation to basically get the permission right. that um, the rec commission to use the facilities. So I, I see your point with the special permit. So uh, maybe it's w accepted in special permission cases or something. Yeah, that might be one that when we have the public hearing, we sort out. <coughs> that was the same one I was going to mention. I we're not we're not trying to restrict any possibility of having a special permit. And that that's that wasn't our intent at all. So it just um, in, in fact, there wouldn't be any big deal with putting it back in there if you think it's important to include that. Well, it's just that it's it's in 54-31. You do have allowed except by special permit. But this one you took out out, so I'm, I'm, I'm just confused. The only one that I have a real question about is, um, is about Hogland and the abutment. And I say that because I think that when it's all done, Hogland and the abutment. Sorry, Grinnell's in the abutment, I apologize. Grinnell's in the abutment, when it's all done, there will be lighting on the abutment. There will be lighting at the beach. There is security lighting down there. And I think, you know, so as not to run amok of this, it might be worthwhile to have a discussion about how late that's going to be open, how long do we let people go down there. Um, the lights may stay on after it's closed because the police feel that there's better security and less chance of vandalism. So it, it's the only thing in here that I see that um, really at the end of the day there might be a significant conflict. I'm not sure exactly how to work it out, but... Um, so you should probably research that with uh, recreation and come up with some new wording anticipating lighting uh is that going to be all night long or i don't i i think at this point it, it it at some point i think there's probably needs to be a discussion that is between that includes the recreation commission the police fire town administrator um and even the council as to exactly how we envision this what I think is going to be a pretty cool new place and how we're going to use it and how we're going to let people use it and what time people get to hang out down there until and all that. It, it, it's the only thing that's going to be there. You know, um, we may have to have language that gives the town a, the ability to be a little flexible based on how we decide sure. that space is going to be used. What, um, do you think the abutment committee could draft something I, that might I, I don't think I don't think that anyone I don't I think this is probably going to be such a departure for the town in terms of its scope and how it might be used I'm not sure that any one committee could probably do it I, I think it's and I also do think that you know police and public safety fire are going to have to weigh in the administrators going to have to weigh in we're probably going to have to talk to the trust about the insurance on things um, I I'm not sure that there's going to be an answer in terms of scheduling a public hearing. It may just be that the language in here needs to reflect some level of flexibility for that space until yeah. we decide how it's going to well, I think I think it would behoove us to draft something for the public hearing, not to just go there with an open door and so we have something to work on. Uh, and someone should do that. Uh, uh, which, which then brings the next question. This is a request to schedule a public hearing. So the, then the question is, should we, um, should we try and sort out a, a, a plan for the abutment in Grinnells before we schedule this public hearing? Which 
or do we want to schedule a public hearing and be a little flexible in the language for this? Thoughts here? The town administrator? I'm just wondering if you could simply add a clause um, unless an exception is uh, approved by the town council. That gives you, you know, the flexibility to make a change where necessary, which I think you would do based on, uh, I mean, you're not going to want lighting after 10 o'clock in the middle of a forest or a beach area necessarily, unless it's, it's an area like this one here. Uh, and maybe there could be some criteria, but just adding that clause that you know, the council could make an exception. Okay. Or you could limit that to just Grinnell Beach. I don't know. Well, in that case, I uh, I'm, I'm going to add. Uh, I should have done this up front. Uh, this bill, this uh, draft, has gone through conservation and. Uh, the recreation mission, and they've all endorsed it uh, as a matter of record. So I also told them that this was happening tonight. So I heard no objections to her late last minute changes. Just on this last uh, issue, I do think that in some locations there's a concern with what happens at night, and there's some experience with vandalism. There are also lighting schemes that don't have to create light pollution. And I think the beach committee has worked on that. So I do think it needs to, you know, be given a little more thought, and I'm sure we can come up with a solution. So I think the two options in front of us right now are to go ahead and schedule the public hearing, <coughs> knowing that we might need to put some, uh, adjust some of the language in here to be flexible around that space, or if, if uh, open space would prefer, we can try and sort out a plan for that space before we go forward. Yeah, I might suggest a possibility we can schedule the public hearing, and we don't have to have the final language at a public hearing. That's a hearing to get all the ideas for changes, and then and then you can approve the ordinance subject to wording for fill in the blank. In that case, uh, Madam Clerk. Well, you have to have pretty much the language this I mean people have to know what it is basically so they'll know whether or not they're in agreement with it you can't just make it all up that night no, I understand that. this is one this is one small provision of the ordinance and what what is the plan um, before say ten years ago before the bridge got really bad people would fish there where they would I don't know what's going to be allowed down there anymore who's going to who determines well, who's going to determine that I, uh, well, first of all, fishing is allowed basically 24 7 in Rhode Island. So that, that's allowed. Yeah. But that's the point is that this is a different kind of recreation space than we've ever had before. And it's going to have much more in the way of lighting opportunity. But it's also, you know, we've got to protect it from vandalism. So, you know, are we going to say to people, if the lights are on on the abutment because the chief says, listen, I think you should leave those lights on until 2 in the morning because I, I, I want, when my guys drive by, I want to see that. Well, does that mean to folks, well, hey, the lights are on on the abutment, I can go out there? I mean, I think we need to think of reasonably what the lighting plan is for security and what reasonable hours that you know people can go there. I mean, this says, for example, recreation areas are generally closed at sunset. Well, you know, the shade cell structure is going to be uplit at night. Can I see people who maybe have, you know, a dinner or maybe go to the Red Dory and then want to go over and sit for a little while and look at the stars? Well, it's after sunset. So I, I think it's a unique space and it, it may not fit in with the rest of the rules like a park or a playground or something that you know stands by itself and really why is anybody there after dark but i think we need to do it could i make a suggestion um, um madam chair uh, you could uh, put this on for public hearing advertise it uh, when you have the hearing that night if you want to just make a minor change you could do it at the hearing discuss it at the hearing and vote on it if you want to take a more comprehensive approach specifically for uh, the, the abutment uh, area, 
that you could still pass this ordinance, but come back with another ordinance, advertise that, and do it as a, a separate ordinance that's added onto this, specifically addressed to uh, the abutment. I think the solicitor has the solution. No, no, that's, we got two projects there. We have the abutment and we have the beach. So we're gonna have to have, because aren't we tied in with the state a little bit for them paying for the beach? Don't they have some say on when that they, opens and closes they, they for fishing? Have, they have some say on charging for parking. And that's, that's, that's it. That's it. So uh, other than that. So they don't have a say to say what time we close it to fishermen. No. Or parking, huh? Just they have a say on what we charge for parking. Well, not even the hours that we are charged for parking. And if I'm not mistaken, we can close the gate to the beach, but you can't stop them from going fishing because they can walk down and fish. They just can't park. They just can't go in there and park, correct. Right. And who determines, we determine that? We determine yes. what time the gate is closed no. with input from the, the town or the, and, the, and the residents of the town who pay the bills. Yes, exactly. All right. So, but I you think could get, you, you could get um, a couple of recommendations from fire and police chief, right, to put it in so it doesn't, so it's not like, it doesn't sound like a huge amount. It's not going to take a long time to get it from, you know, we, we get this, um, we get this public hearing going and you can just, couldn't you just ask them <clears throat> what's their recommendation? Well, I think, I think the people who have been working on this all the time would have a primary role in suggesting what should work down there. Uh, right, so but I'm sure the police chief and the right. fire chief. Actually, Brian do. James is part of that commission. Yeah. He and I could probably work up something. Do you? Maybe we should go forward with like uh, that clerk schedule to count the yeah. public hearing, um, knowing that there are some things will be up for discussion, some particular items that need to be clarified. Council Shabbat mentioned some. Do you foresee Grinnell's opening this season? Or do you think it's going to be late? You think it's going to be after Labor Day? I would say, right? So. Uh, you know, we're, we're waiting on To be on determined. Well, that's what I'm saying. It I mean, is, it's, it's like something that we goes, have to. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day, otherwise we'd have hired right. their contractor. <laughs> but. Um, but I'm. <laughs> But um, I am hopeful, I'm cautiously optimistic, although the, at this point, Grinnell's and the abutment are tied together in that the contractors are dependent Working together. on each other right. from both sides, so when one side stops... Well, I'm only, I'm only saying that because then Madam Clerk could look and see what the schedule looks like for an open meeting rather than trying to cram it in right now. Right. If, you know... I, I, I think we'll leave it up to Matt Clerk to go ahead and schedule the public hearing. I mean, this thing's been laying around for three years, so yeah. another couple of months is going to come. Right, right. Madam Clerk. Yes, I'm thinking uh, October. October. I'm thinking October 9th. October 9th. I'm away that weekend. Madam President, uh, you really need a red line copy of the changes, as well as it was not included in my packet where Section 50-1 was not included, so I'm not sure what's being deleted. Yeah. I would agree with Mr. Councilor Shepard. I would really like, it would be a lot easier for us to have a red line copy of this. I don't think one exists. It depends on what you're asking for. I can give you a red line copy. That would be really helpful. It, it will not be a track changes because that is unreadable. I've already tried That's it. That's okay, but yeah. at least a red line copy. I understand. Madam Clerk. Yes, we're not going back and forth. I object to the ninth. I want to be here. Okay. Fire. That's fine, so we'll pick another day. Okay. I'm going for that week. So, I'm going to be in no, Bermuda. Listen, because yeah, there's only one other meeting after that before the November election. I won't be here either. I'm gone for 10 days. When? Are you going in September? No, October 9th to the 18th. I'm oh, okay. Well, we have two up. Then how about September 24th? I'm, here. I'm not leaving until October, so. That's fine. I might not come back. September 24th? Sure. Okay. That works for me. I love anybody else. I just. Yep. It works for me. Because if I advertise this, what I'm going to have to use is this version of the red line. And 
this isn't actually against the ordinance, the present ordinance. That shows how the... It shows changes, but yeah. it's not tracked to the ordinance, the current right. code. Yeah. I can uh, I can get you something uh, very very quickly probably tomorrow. Good. Thank you. Uh, September twenty fourth. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Next will be Chief Jones' request to implement a research policy for Reserve Officer Corps ROC CSO program. So the presentation that you have in front of you is actually in two parts. Uh, the implementation portion of it is the policy and the memorandum that I submitted to the town administrator to implement the retired or reserve officer corps. Um, to address that one first, that would only pertain to police officers in the state of Rhode Island who have attended the Rhode Island Municipal Police Academy or their equivalent or have retired from the Tiverton Police Department and upon their retirement would be considered reserve police officers. As a reserve police officer, they would enjoy, continue to enjoy all the same duties um, and responsibilities of a law enforcement officer in Rhode Island and we would just use them specifically for details. The second portion of it is the research portion of it for the CSO or the Community Safety Officer Program. Um, that program, uh, what I envision and what I would ask the council to implement would be having young men and women who are interested in law enforcement, criminal justice students possibly from local universities, local men and women who live in town who could assist the town <coughs> in a traffic only or um, community service only capacity no firearms, no arrest powers, and could assist us with traffic details and road work. Um, in the memorandum that I've given to you also, I've checked this with the trust, um, there'd be certain requirements that the, both the reserve officers and the community safety officers would have to go through, and on both instances, there is no financial impact to the town. Arguably, if any one of these individuals, the reserve or the community safety officer, worked a road job, they would pay, be paid for by the vendor, and the town would still impose its administrative fee. May I? Uh, just want to add one thing. Um, the officers, the, this, this three-year separation thing, yes, do you want to explain that? Please? So how it's worked out with the trust, if Officer Jones were to retire today, I can be eligible to be a reserve police officer for three years from the date of retirement. Because after that, what the trust looks at is Law enforcement is a kind of a fluid business. It changes, laws change, policies change. And once you pass that three-year mark, liability exponentially increases. So as long as there's no separation of service. So Officer Jones could become a reserve the day of retirement and serve for another 10 years as long as there's no significant separation. You can't do three years in a day. So it'd have to be all but immediate. So if I were to retire today and ask the police chief that I wanted to be a reserve officer, he or she would appoint me and I would have to maintain the same certifications that we have per policy for a Tiverton police officer and they'd have the same duties and responsibilities. The second um, comment is I had added a note to the requests uh, to be put on the agenda based on the discussion I had a little while ago with the chief thinking that um, there was no need to immediately jump to implementation and that this could be considered in the budget process. It turns out this is actually directly relevant to how the police department can fill its details at the casino. And so there is actually a reason to go a little bit faster. Um, what the chief has done, I think, very well, first of all, is thinking ahead and secondly, developing a draft contract that would be uh, signed by each individual person that would uh, uh, join this reserve core and that has been reviewed by the solicitor and the solicitor can tell you um, what they think about that so there is uh, a document that clearly has people agreeing that they're non-union non-permanent permanent employees that they don't have the benefits uh, things like that and and that's an important thing for you to know so we did review that document 
uh, it looks like a very reasonable contract to us. The only uh, caveat we'd put in there is that we want to have an opportunity to run it by the trust and get trust input on it. So, Chief, I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, the CSO, is that in lieu of, that's only, you use them only if um, uniform offices refuse the? That's correct. Right, so they're not, so that way there's no contract. That is correct. Okay. There's no what? There's no, that way there's. The, uh, an you, say, oh, that CSO right. took my overtime. Right. Oh, I wanted that post, so, yeah. so there'll be it's the last if, call. It's if everyone CSO refuses. Yeah. The yeah. Post. Yeah. Um, they may say that in here. It's, I can't. Right. And I've had discussions with the union about this. So they would enjoy their seniority also right. as full-time permanent members of the police department. But what I envision happening as well is given the casino details, having an officer there 24 hours a day, and then having road work like we've had in other parts of town, that could go unfilled, which right. is still a safety issue for the town. If I can fill that with a CSO who's been trained, who has the traffic details, we don't need a, we need the police officer where the police officer is going to be used the most, and that's going to be at the casino, mm -hmm. where there's the likelihood of possible arrest situations and um, arrest or no arrest decisions. The traffic detail can be filled with that CSO at a reduced rate mm -hmm. and still be covered. And also, it's a it's a good opportunity for young men and women who are interested in law enforcement. Yeah. Um, I, we, we have talked about this concept before in discussions about the casino. So I, I think um, we are supportive of this this approach. I think we've, we've discussed mm -hmm. it enough before. Um, so I think the town solicitors Correct. We probably need the contract reviewed by the trust, and, and that would be great. Um, does this have any impact on accreditation, your accreditation process right now? None right so right now. Actually, this policy, that is the draft policy from the Reserve Officer Program. Um, when I spoke with the representative for police and claim liability, he directed me to Newport. So this mm -hmm. policy and the contract is from Newport, so which they are seeking accreditation so it's a policy that is right from accreditation so it meets all their conditions and standards so we're a okay. little bit ahead of the game with that and i know with the trust they're the ones who pointed me to the policy so i know to address the solicitors uh, solicitors concerns they they said newport has the best policy for reserve offices and cso's uh -huh. in our state excellent excellent i do i have just a couple questions Obviously, these are folks who are making, who are working details, and the town is making money on details. But I do have a question in terms of our responsibility. They get paid a salary. If they're injured, I'm assuming they're covered by workman's compensation. That's correct. Um, but in terms of their uniforms, uh, staying up to date on their firearms qualifications, those kinds of things, we provide them uniform, a uniform stipend. Um, we would not pay for any uniforms. No. So the only thing that we would provide them, so as a reserve officer, um, especially retired ones, I'm assuming that they would have the uniform. So there's that. The only thing that we would give them are badges of office, because we'd have to swear them in as reserves, and the firearm, which would be on loan during the detail, that they'd have to return after the detail. Okay. Everything else they'd be responsible for. And then any training, they would be responsible, which we'd have to pay them for the training as a requirement of the job, but it wouldn't be the four hours of overtime like the union enjoys. It would be a straight time rate that they would come in. And if they did not, because they are at will, at the pleasure of the town and the police chief, non-permanent employees, if we had an officer who was not attending training or did not or failed to certify, he'd be dismissed. And then uh, my second question is about the CSOs. And in full disclosure, I did run into the chief in the parking lot today and asked him because I have an interest in this um, particularly. So, um, and I'm interested in the CSOs actually being able to do a little more than traffic details and, and specifically potentially uh, being able to maybe write parking tickets or hand out a littering fine or to be a presence in some of the places where we've had some issues with vandalism or people misbehaving. I don't know how the chief really feels about that. I don't know how the town administrator feels or the rest of the council. Um, but I, I do think, you know, we can go forward with this, but I'd actually like to see that program to be expanded, to be a little bit more like a few other communities who actually had their CSOs able to do a little bit more than just details. Yeah. Well, we have to look into that with um, 
Labor Council as well, just to uh, make sure we don't catch any grievances or anything like right. that. Right. And I think with the, and I know we, like we spoke about today, you have your animal control officer who under state law has the ability to issue dog fines. So, and I know many cities and towns, especially summer communities like we are, um, have either contract services out or they have a force of parking people that just go out during the times of the year to enforce parking regulations. So, and Newport being one of them, I'm sure that they have a policy that addresses this issue along the same lines of the CSO. Um, and knowing that if a, we're not taking any work away from the police, with the permanent police officers, if anything, we're working with the current full-time police force and having an issue that we can address parking down the beach, we can address um, someone has their dog on a leash and just have a better presence and also hopefully have these young men and women who would eventually be become part of our police department. So it is said that this part is the research part that's not happening uh, in the very near future and because there will be some cost even though it also offers a lot of cost efficiency, uh, I, I would say that it has to come up in the budget process. Agreed. Uh, in that case, I'm not sure whether or not the chief needs a vote tonight or just council consensus to go forward with this. It, Peter, it's not listed as a vote. What no, I, I, I think this is really just put before the council to give you uh, some information about what, we're, what the administrator and the chief were, were, were working on. Um, so, you know, uh, just, you look, add that? just looking for a blood. Yes, and, and I'm going to take uh, the, the, the blame for this, as I said already earlier. My understanding was that this was not needed right away. It turns out it may be needed in two weeks mm -hmm. <laughs> when we start doing details at the, the casino. So uh, that puts us in a difficult situation because you haven't seen the draft policy or the contract. Uh, we ought to get that out to you. Um, I would recommend that you authorize the chief to go forward with uh, implementing this or um, getting this ready for immediate implementation. I believe the next meeting is on the 28th. Yep. And so um, you can ratify uh, the contracts and the policy at that time and I think we should be able to pull it off in time so what my plan would be is to have is one officer from Bristol who's retired who exclusively works road jobs for us right now he um, has does not have the three years of separation I have his resume and the um, letter of recommendation from his chief what I would do next meeting is make a presentation through the town administrator that you appoint him as a reserve officer. I also have a reserve, uh, retired sergeant, Sergeant Cabral, who is interested in becoming a reserve, make a presentation to you with his resume and my recommendation along with the town administrators. So this way, from there, they would go and see the clerk so they could get sworn in as reserve officers and we could use them under this program. How about the CSO? Do you have guys lined up? Not yet, because what I'd like to do is we've implemented our Explorer post at the high school. So that's kicking off when the students go back to school. And I'm hopeful that we'll have some high school age students that are moving into whether Roger Williams, CCRI, New England Tech, Salve, that are interested in criminal justice programs that we can start home, I prefer to start homegrown before we start getting um, criminal justice students that want to come into town. I'd like to start with Tiverton youths that are going to schools locally and utilize them. So I'm hopeful that by next spring when the road work starts up again for next season and also we're on the cusp of that graduating class moving into college that will have a pool of good men and women who have been part of our Explorer Post who we vetted who we know are of good character and are local that would like to kick the program off then. And they must be 21? Uh, 18. Oh, 18? <clears throat> because they are on no firearm. Correct, sir. Okay. In that case, they think I'll, I'll make that a motion to give the chief the consensus to go ahead and pursue this. I'll second it. And then we'll see it in more, or we'll have more information on the agenda at the next meeting. That's correct. Ideally. Okay. Motion second. All in favor? Thanks. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you, Chief. Sounds good. Tab administrator approve appointment of William McGrady as building official. Thank you, and Mr. McGrady is here. Um, maybe he can come to the table. Um, 
As you know, and I, I summarized it in my um, request to be put on the agenda, uh, the process, we, we went through the interviews with the personnel board and a second interview in my office. Uh, they went exceptionally well. Uh, I believe that we have a great candidate here. We have, however, run into a little complication with the certification. The end of my uh, blurb in the request for the agenda said that it should be, or it would be no problem. And uh, I don't think it's going to be a huge problem, but it wasn't quite as easy as uh, I've been told it would be uh, by someone who's in the business. Um, the Rhode Island Building Commissioner was not quite as encouraging about how easy it would be to go from the Massachusetts certification to the Rhode Island certification. Uh, there are some differences in what is required uh, by the two states, and uh, the Building Commission here is pretty intent on making sure that its requirements are being met. Also, uh, Mr. McGrady was a provisional building commissioner in Swansea and still had a couple or one course or tests left uh, to do. So that needs to be done in order to be ready for the Rhode Island certification as well. Uh, I spoke most recently with the building, the Rhode Island building commissioner he ended up saying that um, the outstanding test could be taken online uh, as soon as Mr. McGrady is willing to do so. And then uh, when he passes them, he can arrange for an interview with the commission um, and, and then get the go ahead to serve and act as an actual uh, building official rather than just a building inspector. Uh, since then, I think Mr. McGrady has looked into what his options are and is actually ready to make arrangements to take the tests at a test site. There are some downsides to doing it online. If you uh, lose the connection, you lose everything that you've done up to that point. Uh, and he believes you can do that as soon as next, next week? Uh, yes, sir. Next week. So with that, um, I, I imagine you can you know, ask some questions that you may have for Mr. McGrady now, and then you have the option of either bringing this back at the next council meeting or um, approving the appointment subject to uh, the certification being uh, obtained and the start date being after that certification uh, is obtained. Can you just say, so is it next next Thursday? Is that what you? I'm sorry. I don't what know. We, when do you think you're going to take get the uh, um, certification? The tests are readily available. Okay. Um, so you can go on and pick a date at any you know particular time. Um, I'm very familiar with the testing um, because the it's a very similar process in Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, but it used to be reciprocal from Massachusetts to Rhode Island. It's no longer so. So you have to make sure that you're fully certified in both states. That was, I was unaware of that um, coming in. We thought that we had a six month um, window, so to speak, to get the certification um, taken care of. So, so what's, what's the time frame then now? Well, I'm, I'm hopeful to, um, I don't like to take them both in the same, I've, there are a series of six exams. Okay. Okay, I have four that are, are complete. So you don't have to do those again? I do not. Okay. The, the crossover comes um, with the Rhode Island and Mass. There's a, there's a couple that, that are um, varied. So I'm going to take uh, the first one that is required uh, as soon as Monday. Um, okay. And then I was possibly going to take the, the next one the following Monday. And do you know right away if you passed or not? I do. Okay. You get your results. And do you, do you, if, you, if you don't pass, do you have a chance to take it, retake it, or you have to have a certain okay. amount of time in between? No, you can. You can, you can do it right away. Yes, you may. Okay. And then after that, and then let's just say everything goes fine, you get two pet tests passed. Then what's the process to get you all certified? The process in Rhode Island is that I have to sit down with the uh, commissioner in Rhode Island mm -hmm. and just be interviewed by him. Okay. And it, I'm just I'm just trying to figure out time-wise. So how long does that take? 
Um, I'm not talking about the interview itself. It's like I'm talking about is it like th three weeks before they get you get in there to see him or her? Well, I believe and that um, the town administrator had spoken to him and said that he could possibly uh, make a special arrangement okay. with us to get my interview done as soon as the testing was complete. Okay. So they're going to try to move it. Okay. Okay. But again, my recommendation is to uh, either approve you know, subject to certification and um, actually that's probably my recommendation just approve it subject to the certification and the start date not uh, being until after the certification has been obtained that's probably the cleanest way to do it so moved what he said <laughs> <laughs> now you're stealing my one <laughs> does anyone have any other questions for I, I do um, you want to second that? Oh. When I found out that you were going to be, which is only a few days ago, I know there was some talk going around. This, this. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, well, when I found out, uh, can you mind if I call you Bill or William? No, it's fine. Uh, Bill, all right? That's the last bill worked out real good. Um, um, there's, there was some baggage that came along with you that's online, and I did some research, okay? So I went and I called everybody. Um, you come highly recommended from just about everybody I talked to, even though your baggage is behind you. So I just say welcome to Tiverton, and whatever's happened anywhere else, I'll leave there, and everybody deserves a shot. But I did do a extensive research, and I checked with a whole bunch of people because of what I found. So, and they all, you came highly recommended, even from officials from other spots. So, uh, welcome to Tiverton, if everybody else feels the same way as me. I do have a couple questions. Sure. Do you know a lot about Tiverton? Do you know much about Tiverton? I've uh, been born and raised in, in the town. Uh -huh. uh, Fifty-eight <laughs> years old. Right? There you go. So you, you, so you know that this is, this isn't an easy place to be the building official. Um, you know, it's really not an easy place anywhere to be a building official. That's true. Um, having said that, um, and I believe the town administrator and I. Uh, conversed at length about this is that for me um, from a um, enforcement standpoint consistency is key so if I tell one person that they are required to do something um, I expect that everybody else should have to do the same follow the same process play by the same rules um, and that plays into what um, you had said Councilor LeBeau because uh, I'm not going to go down that road. There's Only, no need. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No need. Suffice to say that it's a it's a tough position, and not everybody's happy at the end of the day all the time if you're doing your job the right way. Absolutely. Um, well, as long as you know what you're getting into, um, I think that would be wonderful. I do also agree with uh, Councilor Shevitt that I think that we should appoint subject to. Uh, having your certification because we will need to keep Felix on and continue to pay him until we have that right mm -hmm. um, so if that's okay with you I think that that's the way I go if that's the case and someone wants to make a motion Do you have a second? Second. Sorry. The sign is on. They're done. So in that case. Well, so so you know uh, Councilor Edwards is not here tonight and he feels the same way I do and he wanted that mentioned. Okay, so noted. So noted. In that case, we have a motion and a second uh, to, uh, let me just get the wording here, to make sure that we've got this right. Um, are we approving the contract or doing the ratification first, Peter? So the ratification would be first, and the contract, when you approve it, would just be, um, you know, same condition not to be entered until uh, uh, he gets it's his certifications. Okay. Um, so are we doing the contract separately uh, as a vote? Yeah, I think in case anybody has a comment on the okay. language. In that case, so the first motion is uh, to approve the appointment of William McGrady as the building official uh, pending certification. Certification. Pending certification as a Rhode Island State building official. Motion is second. All in favor? 
Okay, on to the contract. Are there any questions on the contract? Or discussion? Madam President, I'll bring up my, 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 my stick with the car again. I would like the people of Tiverton to know that they own the cars. And I would like that, that painted thing to be not this little thing like this because we have had in the past people thinking it's their own private vehicle. So if he's getting a car, which is fine with me, do we have one with an appropriate size uh, so people can see it, so they don't need to go up with a magnifying gla uh, glass and say, who is this person? And it sounds silly, except if you see abuse, and then it's not so silly. So I'm each time I, I will do this for every single car as it's coming along to get those, to get those um, big so everybody in town knows that it belongs to the town. That'd be mocked appropriately. And we marked appropriately and, and, and uh, big enough so you can see it. And when we see the building inspector coming, we can lock the door so you can't get it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, just, it's just the past. You know, I don't want to keep going down that same path where people, you know, where there has been abuse. I want to get it straightened I've out. Had, I've had problems in my tenure in Fall River. Um, I was there for over 10 years. We used to use our own vehicles and we were paid a stipend um, to, to do so. And it did create problems, as you, you, know, you can imagine, pulling up on someone's property with Rhode Island plates, which I have, um, being a Massachusetts building official. So. And my last question on the car is, this particular vehicle um, would be a car to be used during working hours, not a commuting vehicle, correct? That's correct. Okay. Just one last thing. The, the contract obviously will have different dates for the start date. Uh, in that case, I make a motion to ratify a contract with the building official. Um, one year contract with two one year extensions, um, subject to uh, certification. Uh, the contract would begin the day following certification. Second. Uh, I have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? Because I do have one discussion question, which is, unless I missed it, I don't actually have salary information in my packet. Yeah. I think it's salary information right there. Number four. Yeah. Oh, there it Page is. Two. Sorry. I was looking for this, like the fiscal impact statement, but I'm assuming since the salary is this, there is. I think there was a fiscal impact statement. Yes, I think there's a third. Oh, it may be as part of the. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I think the data of this is, though, that the fiscal impact would be the same as our. And it was posted. And it was posted. In that case, I made public two days if, the, right. if it's not a change. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't yeah. changed from the last one. Okay. In that case, in that case, I have a motion and a second. Unless there's further discussion, all in favor? Welcome aboard. Good luck with your exams. We look forward to you, you so passing much. them and joining us. Thank you. Come to Connor River office and get your T-shirt. Randy. <laughs> Everybody gets a T-shirt. Yeah, but you have to do that offline after hours. <laughs> What's the matter with free plug ones and all? Next, town clerk approval to hire a temporary employee for 25 hours per week until the end of November to cover cover personnel in the clerk's office during the election cycle, and request to transfer six thousand dollars from the council contingency. Uh, yes, I'm going to have a um, one of the clerks in the uh, town clerk's office will be out for at least six to eight weeks with some um, medical issues. So uh, right now, that office is also cut back to three and a half personnel instead of the four. And I had discussed this at the time with the Budget Committee and the Council that 
come election time, this is going to be hard to get through with just three and a half people. The, the state puts a lot more burden on the towns. And with um, this happens to be my key personnel in that office. Um, I'm going to have to try to replace her as well. I have been increasing the part-time hours through the election account because she is working just on elections. But this is going to be to actually cover a miss, uh, clerk that will be out just for the length of time she's going to be out. I did come before the council and ask for permission to advertise. Uh, we did advertise. and. Um, the interviews are going to be Thursday, and I think there's some pretty good candidates there. I'll make a motion that we uh, grant the clerk permission to uh, get a part-time temporary employee. Motion is there second? Second. 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 Any discussion? All those in favor? <coughs> Can't have Jeannie work any more than she already does. I know. But does that include, I'm sorry, was that also include the $6,000 from the council contingency? I'll put that in my motion. Second. I have a motion second to transfer $6,000 from the council contingency fund to account 1010-5102 clerk personnel. All in favor? I didn't have all of uh, yes, the next item is DPW Director Rogers request approval to purchase a used 2008 <coughs> International 7400 <coughs> Sander combo body and plow. Hi, good evening again. Welcome. Hi. Currently, DPW has uh, two 1993 and two 1994 uh, plow trucks. We would like to replace one of them with this 2008. It has a stainless steel body with a front sander and a plow hookup. It's got about 2,200 hours and about 22,000 miles. It's uh, good in really good shape. Uh, Kim has looked at it a couple times, the foreman, and the assistant, the new assistant mechanic, looked at it today, and they're both happy with it. Uh, new trucks like this go for 150,000 or more. This is coming in around 50,000. The stainless steel dump bodies and sanders, the front sanders, the rear sanders, they go for between 50 and $60,000 uh, new. So the $50,000 price is a good price for what we're getting. So we would like to purchase it. And if there's any questions. Questions? I have a question, but. I do too when you're done. Because I want to make sure that this is the truck. Because I did some research on the truck before I knew this was we, before we got our packet. So with it, it's 22,000 miles on that truck. Is that what they're saying? Yeah, approximately 22,000. Yes. Okay. So for some strange reason, I pulled out the same one right there. Yeah. So you can see it in color. And so I did some and found out what's going on with the truck, and I looked up the price of a new truck. So. Um, so my first question is: as part of the budget this year, we budgeted for two new DPW trucks. This isn't one of those two trucks, right? Correct. This Correct. is a third truck right. that we're looking at <coughs> because. Can I explain more part of that? Um, there has been a discussion for quite some time about the uh, trucks that we have and to what extent we have the capacity to reply. We still have um, what are referred to fondly as antiques. Mm -hmm. that may not make it through the next winter. Um, the availability of this truck was mentioned, I think, in the presence of the treasurer who suggested that uh, we do have an account uh, that could be used to acquire this if, in fact, it's such a good opportunity and um, could, could save us a significant amount of money. So that's why we're looking at it. It, it was not something that was planned for a long time. The opportunity came up. It was mentioned. The treasurer thought that uh, this might be a way to do it, and let's bring it before the council. Um, so I know the condition of the vehicle down at the DBW garage. 
Um, there's rumors around town that four of them are not going to pass inspection in November. Um, was that? The deplorable four of them. I know they are. They're, they're absolutely junk. So after the research I did on this truck, I don't know where the money's coming from. I knew it wasn't budgeted, but um, deal-wise, it's. I'm not really the kind of guy that likes to buy used stuff. I say go buy a new one, but this is really a great. If it's what's in the package there, it's really a good deal. It's one third the price. Um, with a few miles on it, so if we got the money, I'm in, I'm on board because um, I know we got a bunch of crap parked in the gar in the garage down there. So you want to make that a motion, man? I do. Good man. But we, we got to find. I don't know where the money's coming from. That's why the Denise is here. Oh, <laughs> you snuck up over there. It, uh, if you recall, fiscal year 17, we established the resolution to put 25 percent of the unexpended funds at the end of the year into a capital reserve account. So for fiscal year 17, which was a very uh, tight year, we grows out $25,000. This year, I'm estimating at least 90000 will be added to that. So for fiscal year 19, we'll start with around $115,000 in the reserve account for capital. So that said, we can pay for this truck cash. Yes. I Which was why when Kim came to me with that, um, he, he said, I have this opportunity. How could we make this work? And that's really the only way we could make it work. I'll second Randy's motion. I, I do have one question. When you buy a truck like this, and forgive my not knowing this about buying a commercial truck, does it come with a warranty? Uh, I will check on that. I do <coughs> In that case, the mechanic better check it really carefully. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other discussion? Nope. With uh, 22,000 miles, these our trucks that we have now have like 240,000 miles, correct? I don't know the answer to that. Right? Yeah, I, I believe I, I looked there. So with this, this truck's only got 10% of the use right now. So at one third the price, so long as it's like uh, Councilor sure. Hilton said, you know, if it comes with a warranty, just it's a little better. Right. If one's available for a used one and it's a couple of bucks, probably wouldn't be a bad idea either. Oh, you mean to buy a warranty? What's that? You mean to buy a warranty? To buy a warranty. Yeah, it, it under a at least certain parts of it, the, the stuff that's really, really expensive to replace. Engine drivetrain and stuff. Well, this truck is going to be coming from the same place that the other two trucks are coming from, correct? Mm -hmm. So. So if it's, if it's available sure. for a 10-year-old truck, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to spend a couple grand on a warranty for engine training and all the breakable stuff. So if do you want to amend your motion? Yeah, I'll, I'll amend my motion for 50000 for the vehicle and a warranty if it's available. Do you want to say how much? Well, yeah. for a reasonable I mean, amount. I don't know what warranties run on the vehicles. Um, I know what they run on the car. I don't know what it would run on something well. like that. So, Director Rogers, do you know? Well, no, no, I do not know what a warranty would cost, but as uh, Council had mentioned, about a powertrain, block, etc. I, I do not know. Well, since we're, buying, since we're buying this from the place we're getting the other vehicles, if there is a warranty option, then I'm sure that they would be willing, if we wanted to take it, for us to vote on it at the next meeting, in other words. Yeah. Then, if it's a good deal and it's a good warranty and it's worth it and the price is right, so we'll bring um, it up to next meeting. We could discuss it next meeting. And so, in that case, I have a motion and a second. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Randy, Any other discussion? Motion, All in favor? I have a question. So, Are we sorry. buying this subject to getting the warranty? No. We're not no. buying it subject okay. to getting the warranty, but we're, we're going buying to it. We're buying it and then see what the warranty yes. would cost okay. us. And no. Come back with a. But we don't want to lose it. Right. Right. So that's why. So we're purchasing it, but we're going to bring up the next council meeting on a warranty issue. If available. So if if the warranty is available, available how much? Yeah. For how long? Three years, five years, two years, whatever right. it is. Yep. Just to protect our investment. Yes. Try and get one for free, though. <laughs> 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 Good luck with that. Thank you. I'm going to give you 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, town, 
Uh, we don't have any bids and requests for proposals. Town administrator announcements, update on employment vacancies. And the update is directly relevant because we have two mechanics now in uh, in DPW. The uh, part-time mechanic uh, started today. The full-time will start tomorrow, and they'll take very good care of this truck. Um, the only other announcement is I'm only making because um, I, I need a sense from you who might be attending. One is the ribbon cutting on the 22nd uh, next week at 11 o'clock in the morning uh, of the roundabout. And then we have the casino opening, the soft opening starting on the 30th, the public opening uh, on September 1st. But for the soft opening, too, I need to know who will be representing um, the council. And I'm not sure that has been arranged yet because town council president indicated she might not be able to do it. I was going to talk to you, but if after the meeting we could maybe figure out who's able to do this, that would be helpful. What were the, what were the two dates? The 22nd and the 30th. Do you know what time? The 22nd is the uh, at 11 o'clock, and on the 30th is 10 o'clock in the morning. So, um, I thought we already got we already got the invitation for the 30th. Didn't you people? This is also to. Um, I think they're. You may well have had. Some of you may have already responded because yeah. Kim Ward told me some of you responded direct. Well, I never you got. Might want to let the I will not be in town. Because nobody uses my personal. And I don't know if you want to make any, it's not on the agenda, so you can't really make any formal decision, but it's important that someone represent the council and offer a few remarks. Well, um, have the, has the council president or the council vice president weighed in yet on their attendance? I've discussed it a few times with Denise, who indicated that she has um, difficulty with the schedule and may not be able to do it. And I thought she, the last time we spoke, she was going to talk and figure out who else on the council. But I'm getting urgent uh, requests from Rhode Island DOT and from Twin River because they need to get the program ready. I would suggest that if anybody on the council is um, able to attend and willing to say a few words, that they might let Jan know sometime in the next 24 hours. What words do we have to say? <laughs> hey, nice job. <laughs> nice rotary. Looks great. Looks great. We're happy to have it. Okay. Uh, any other announcements, Jan? Uh, Council announcements. Uh, Councilor De Medeiros had one. She's not here. I'm suggesting that we table this until the following meeting. Actually, she discussed this with me, and all it is is uh, the idea that we have always put out a booklet when we have multiple charter amendments. And uh, before I venture in a lot of time that this could be, I just wanted to make sure that the council wanted. I have to put it in the newspaper. I have to put something in the newspaper listing all the questions anyway. That's required. But we usually send these out. We used to do them through direct mail. Now the post office has something going. I thought I'd kind of check into it. Um, what I'll do is try to get some prices and come back and let you know what it is. Uh, problem with the post office is they will only mail to all residents and not just electors. So um, we'll have to see what it goes. It's, it might, it's going to be lengthier this time. I've, I've always held it to, you know, the two page like this fold over. So, but anyway, if the council wants it done, we will find a way to get it done, but it will be costly. Can we put them in a bag with a rock? <laughs> you can, but I won't. So, so do we have we have budget for that? No, there is no budget. You're going to have to pay for this. We're going to have to find a means to pay do you have a for this. Mark of what it might cost? It's going to cost a few thousand dollars. I think the last one cost me about three thousand dollars. So that's why I'm saying right. it's a lot of work and planning if we're not going to, if we don't want to do this. I think we need a. I think we need a cost on it. 
at this point if we don't have a budget for it? Well, I think, I mean, we do have money in the contingency fund. I mean, personally, I think it's important. It's a well, big deal. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, I agree with know, that. For people to understand what the charter changes really mean. And, and so, but I do think we need a cost. If it's $14,000, you know, I don't think it will be. It's not going to be fourteen, but it could very well be three, thirty, between three and 4000 Don't you think? Because you've got to mail it out. How about the newspaper? Well, not everybody gets the newspaper. Not everybody gets yeah. the you could put it as an insert, but still, there's no guarantee. The only way you have a guarantee to get it to the mail. household is to do mail. direct mail to the household. So I, I think I'll, like my I'll, I'll try to work on some. Should go for preparing them. May not even be done. Any other town council announcements? Mm. Town solicitor announcements. Town clerk items and announcements. Uh, we have no close to.